A very good afternoon to one and all. I'm Dr. Sidra Ansari and in this session I'm going to talk about general anesthesia. General anesthesia by definition is an altered physiological state by reversible loss of consciousness, analgesia of the entire body, amnesia and to some degree of muscle relaxation. Now historically the anesthesia it was process was seen in 1799 by Davy when he first used nitrous oxide along with oxygen and termed it as laughing gas. Later on in 1824 Hickman used this nitrous oxide to am used on animal and amputated their leg. In 1844 will a dentist use nitrous oxide for the extraction, painless extraction of a tooth. But sadly he got addicted to ether and was killed himself in the prison. Later on, in 1842, Long was the one who used ether as an agent to remove a tumour in the neck, wherein Snow, a physician in 1847, was the first one to study deeply the anesthesia process and he was the one who found out the clinical stages of anesthesia. The historical movement took place when William Morton publicly demonstrated a surgical procedure using ether. Ether no longer used now in modern practice yet was considered to be the first ideal anesthetic. Because of the advent of modern techniques and the technologies along with the advancement in the drug, other agents are used like halothane, isoflurane, sevoflurane and disflurane. Now the principle of general anesthesia is basically depend upon three main pillars. One is the minimum potency of the harmful direct and indirect effect of anesthetic agent and the technique. Now, sustained physiological hemostasis during the surgical procedure and improved post-operative outcome. Let's move on to the mechanism of action of general anesthesia. Mayer and Overton initially pointed out that there is a direct parallelism between the lipid water partition coefficient of general anesthesia and their anesthetic potency. He coined the term that is minimal alveolar concentration. Now it is the minimal concentration of the local anesthetic that is required to bring about the desired effect of the anesthesia. That is immobility to a surgical or a harmful stimulus. Now this basically reflects the capacity of the anesthetic to enter into the central nervous system and attain a sufficient concentration. But it does not describe the mechanism of general anesthesia. Later on, in recent evidence, it is seen that there is a direct interaction of general anesthetic molecules with the lipid protein interface of the nerve. It is also said that different general anesthesia have different molecular mechanism. Thus, an anesthetic state, different anesthetic state is because of the action at different foci of cerebral spinal axis. That is, contrast to local anesthesia which act on the nerve conduction, general anesthesia try to act at the synaptic level. It prevents synaptic propagation. Now, ligand gated sodium channel, that is, are the major target of the anesthetic agent. Now, GABA receptor, that is, gated chloride channel. Now, barbiturates benzodiazepine and propofol, they potentiate the action of the inhibitory transmitter GABA to open the calcium chloride channel. Now block responsiveness of this eventually block responsiveness to painful stimuli resulting in immobility of the anesthetic agent. The net inhibitory effect is reduced activity of the neuron. This is a diagrammatic representation where in the site where the GABA is attached to the chloride channel and can bring about the general anesthetic action. Now it is also seen that inhibition of neuronal that is cation channel gated by nicotinic cholinergic receptors which may mediate analgesia and amnesia. So also say that nitrous oxide and ketamine act on glutamate receptor which is mainly gated by calcium and selectively action on these channel on the neurons. Let's move on to these stages of anesthesia. The first stage is the analgesia, which is from the induction of anesthesia to the loss of consciousness, wherein there is loss of eyelid reflex. Amnesia eventually developed at the end of this stage. The second stage is delirium, which is characterized by unhindered excitation, 
pupils are dilated and eyes divergent. There is agitation, delirium, irregular respiration, breath holding are commonly seen. Vomiting, laryngospasm, tachycardia and uncontrolled movement are also seen in this stage. The third stage is the surgical anesthesia. It is characterized by central gaze, constricted pupil and regular respiration. Now, the target depth of anesthesia is sufficient when the painful stimuli does not elicit any somatic reflex or deleterious anatomical reflex. Now, this third stage has four planes. The first plane in which the pupil does not become reactive to light. The second stage is the surgical phase where the corneal and laryngeal reflexes are lost. The third is the pupil they become to dilate and eventually the fourth phase the pupil will become fixed. Now the fourth stage is medullary paralysis. It characterized by onset of apnea. There is dilated and unresponsive pupil. If not controlled, there is hypertension which will eventually complicate the circulatory failure. Now the hallmark of anesthesia is amnesia, unconsciousness, analgesia and muscle relaxation. Now the kinetics of anesthesia consists of three main procedures. One is the induction, second is the maintenance of the anesthesia and third is the recovery. Now induction is nothing but it is the period of time from the onset of administration of the anesthetic to the development of the effective surgical anesthesia in the patient. It depends upon how fast the anesthetic reaches the brain. Whereas recovery is nothing but the time from the discontinuation of this anesthetic till the consciousness is waking, that is how fast the anesthetic comes out of the brain. Whereas maintenance is the time which the patient is surgically anesthetized. Anesthesia is usually maintained by administration of gaseous or a volatile agent because it is good to have a minute-to-minute -minute control over the depth of the anesthesia. Now, two types of anesthetics are there. Inhalational anesthetic and intravenous anesthetic. Inhalational are basically used for maintenance, whereas intravenous are used for induction and short procedures. Now, inhalational anesthetic, the advantage is that you can control the depth of anesthesia. The metabolism is very minimal and they are excreted by exhalation. Now these inhalation anesthetic are broadly divided into two main categories, non-halogenated gases and halogenated hydrocarbons. Now non-halogenated gases are nothing but nitrous oxide, whereas halogenated hydrocarbons are halothane, isoflurane, desflurane, sevoflurane, methoxyflurane. Now the important characteristics of these inhalation agents is that solubility in the blood that is blood gas partition coefficient and solubility in the fat that is oil gas partition coefficient we will see both of them in detail okay first we begin with the blood gas partition coefficient it basically measures the solubility of the anesthetic in the blood it determines the rate of induction and recovery of the inhalational anesthesia that is lower the blood gas coefficient Faster is the induction and recovery, for example, nitrous oxide. And higher is the gas coefficient, slower is the induction and recovery, example is halothane. Similarly, oil gas partition coefficient is nothing but the measure of the lipid solubility. Lipid solubility correlates strongly with the potency of the anesthetic. Higher the lipid solubility, more potent the anesthetic, for example, halothane. Let's move on to an individual inhalational agent. We begin with nitrous oxide. It is the safest inhalational anesthetic, weak anesthetic but a good analgesic. No toxic effect on the heart, liver and kidney. But you have to be cautious about diffusion hypoxia and megaloblastic anemia which could arise because of nitrous oxide. Then second is halothane. Potent anesthetic and induction is pleasant. It dilates the bronchi, so it is preferably used in case of asthmatic. It inhibits uterine contraction, but it causes halothane hepatotoxicity, that is hepatitis, and malignant hypertension can occur in few cases. Then come isoflurane. It is commonly used with oxygen or nitrous oxide. It do not sensitize the heart to catecholamine. It's pungency and can irritate the respiratory system. The next in this line is desflurane, which is a greater version. It is basically like require a specialized, you have vas 
specialized vaporizers to dispense it. It is used in daycare procedure because induction and recovery is faster and cognitive and motor impairment are short-lived. But it irritates the air passage, producing cough and laryngospasm. So we need to be careful in case of pediatric patient. Then the sevoflurane. The induction and recovery is faster in this. It is pleasant and acceptable compared to the other. It does not cause airway irritation, but it has caused nephrotoxicity. So we need to be cautious about the dose that we are using. Let's move on to the parenteral anesthetic agent. Now the use basically for induction of anesthesia. It has rapid onset of action since we are giving an IV. The recovery is mainly by the redistribution. Also, the reduce the amount of inhalation anesthetic that is used for maintenance. Example are thiopentane, midazolam, propofol, etomidate and ketamine. Now, let's take a look at a few of them. To begin with, thiopentane. It is an ultra short acting barbiturate. Your consciousness is regained within 10 to 20 minutes by redistribution to skeletal muscle. It does not increase the intracranial tension. It is eliminated slowly from the body by metabolism and produce hangover. It can also use for rapid control of seizures. The next is Propofol. Most commonly used IV anesthetic. It causes unconsciousness in 45 seconds and lasts for around 15 minutes. It has an antiemetic effect. It is used for daycare surgeries because the residual impairment is less marked compared to the other. And the third is ketamine. Now it produces profound analgesia, then cataleptic state, immobility, amnesia with mild sleep. Therefore, it is also called as dissociative anesthesia. It acts by blocking NMDA receptors. Now the heart rate and the blood pressure are elevated due to sympathetic stimulation. The respiration is not depressed and the reflex are not abolished in case of ketamine. Now, but emergency delirium, hallucination and, inv and involuntary movement occur in 50% of the cases when you use ketamine. It is useful for burn dressing in case of surgical trauma and dangerous in case of hypertensive patient and those with ischemic heart disease. Let's move on to the pre-anesthetic medication. Now basically these are administered prior to the anesthesia to do four main things. First is decrease pain, release anxiety, decrease excessive secretion and combat nausea. Now the pre-anesthetic medication are broadly grouped into the four categories. The anxiolytic drug that will produce sedation and decrease the anxiety that is diazepam midazolam. Then the narcotic analgesic, they decrease the pain like morphine and fentanyl. Neuroleptic, that is promethazine, they are antiemetic. And anticholinergic, like scopolamine, they basically decrease the secretion and cause bronchial dilatation. Now different type of intubation of general anesthesia. First is rapid sedation intravenous intubation. In this case, you will sedate a uh, hypnotic or intravenous anesthetic agent is used. Patient become unconscious. Then you start with face mask ventilation for 5 minutes with the use of close fit face mask by giving 100% oxygen. This is followed by muscle relaxant and then you will do your tracheal intubation. Now, this advantage of this is that there is irregular, uh, there is regurgitation and vomiting, cardiovascular depression, respiratory depression, there is histamine release, there is pain on injection, hiccups and muscle movement. The next is inhalation induction. Now these are basically used in young children when there is upper airway obstruction like epiglottitis, lower airway obstruction because of foreign body where you cannot intubate that in that case you have to use inhalation agent. Then bronchopural fistula or that is inaccessible vein. Veins are not available for IV induction. So in that case you will use for inhalation agent. Now here in this case, nitrous oxide 70% is used with oxygen and an anesthesia is deepened by gradual introduction of incremental volatile agent like a halothane, isoflurane or enfumurane. Now the characteristics is that there is spontaneously ventilation has to be maintained in this. The face mask is applied firmly and, and consistently consciousness is lost and the airway is supported manually. Now insertion of an oropharyngeal airway, laryngeal mass airway or that is tracheal tube to establish the anesthesia. Now disadvantage is that slow induction of anesthesia, airway obstruction can occur, bronchospasm, laryngeal spasm or hiccups can occur. 
Now the third technique is induction with spontaneous ventilation. These are basically used in two categories where there is airway obstruction or there is an anticipated difficult intubation in case of retruded mandible TMJ joint ankylosis. Here we maintain spontaneous ventilation throughout the procedure. That is we do blind awake intubation in case of TMJ patient and we have to provide sufficient surface anesthesia. Now let's move on to a sequence of intubation, maintenance and extubation which are most commonly used. Okay. Here we pre-medicate the patient first by oral diazepam 10 mg on the night before the surgery. Then on the day of surgery, when you take the patient in the OT, we give injection glycopyruvate 0.2 mg IV before induction. Now then you start your induction with thiopentone sodium 4 to 7 mg per kg body weight without adequate pre-oxygen after adequate pre-oxygenation. Then you give succinylcholine 1 to 2 mg to facilitate laryngospasm and intubation, that is a muscle relaxant. Then you will maintain your anesthesia with nitrous oxide and oxygen mixture. Or you could use 0.5% halothane plus vecuronium bromide. Once the procedure is over, then you extubate the patient with the help of neostigmine 0.05 to 0.8 mg per kg or glycopyrrolate is used for extubation. Now complication of general anesthesia can be broadly divided into those that occur in during anesthesia and after anesthesia. During anesthesia is you are not doing pre-oxygenation properly, you are depriving the cell from the oxygen, not giving muscle relaxation properly, okay, not giving your anticholinergic, so intubation become difficult, which will result in aspiration, asphyxia, okay, the respiration will become irregular, pneumonitis can occur. Then after anesthesia, it could be like when you are trying to extubate the patient at that time, laryngeal spasm can occur. The patient will have a state of mild sedation, delirium because of the anesthetic effect. Nausea, vomiting can occur. With this, I would like to conclude by saying that pain is the main thing that brings the patient to the dental clinic and control of pain and anxiety is an essential part of dental practice. Now various techniques are used like in form of local anesthetic, various combination of sedation and general anesthesia to treat the pain. But the choice of technique depend upon the nature and severity of the procedure, the physical and psychological state of the patient and the level of pain and anxiety of the patient. With all this, we need to keep in mind and try to make all our surgical procedures more acceptable and friendly to the patient. Thank you.